these are the people um, having worked together and presenting in this session. It's me, Andreas, um, Angela Kreitenweiss from Token Engineering Academy, Paula Beermann from Democracy Earth. She will be presenting proof of personhood and Renzo D'Andrea, who will be presenting about uh, polycentric governance. And now let's jump onto the frame number three, orientation. We have yellow stars where we ask you, what is your starting point in relation to this topic? And then we have some more um, a question about what are the background is a background from you to see how diverse is this group and where you're coming from, from which perspective. perspective. The yellow stars are supposed to be done and I see many people are already doing it um, to put into the circles and the blue ones to the uh, squares. And let's wait for some time. I put on a, um, a timer of two minutes, but let's see how, lo how long signals are moving. Maybe here I would like to uh, emphasize to the audience that this will allow us to generate even more conversation uh, throughout the session. So uh, please feel free to play around. Yeah, sometimes the stars become bigger, huge. Yeah. So uh, feel free to put any, any size as long as you participate. I see there are still stars moving. So let's see, we see a lot in the center, which is great but also a lot in the challenges. So it seems to be some people are really looking at concrete aspects or challenges. Hmm. I, I just got to say that uh, for me, this is too small. I cannot read. You can zoom in uh, then it becomes be bigger, but you're right. The frame is quite big. So on the top bottom right, you can zoom in like this and then it's easier to pick the stars. You're right, but then you have to uh, zoom a little bit. Yeah, it's just uh, sorry, Andreas, just because I see on the chat, even you just join in. Uh, what we are doing, we're just asking the audience to place your yellow starts and the blue starts just to describe your starting point and your background. This will connect the, the next steps. So, yeah, we have 13 seconds left. I think there's still movement, but most of the people seem to have placed their stars. I see some words, co-op, co great. Yeah, <laughs> very good. Yeah, and this is really one idea also. Now time is over, let's see. Um, okay, a lot of people looking to solve concrete challenges and many people also wanting to learn solving solu uh, challenges and curiousness. So it seems to be interesting to uh, conversations with uh, to be as interesting conversation with you and we see a lot of people from the blockchain web3 space i to be honest that i did not expect but great and your think tanks pretty diverse from the background nobody from government regulation but also all in their research profit for profit non-profit great so I would say let's move on to the next frame, frame number four, which is the market failure frame. And there, one moment, I have to move on. Looks over. like we're about to be sucked back into the general room. Pardon? Uh, oh. Yeah, Break so close. I saw the announcement, hopefully, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, there were like more than 40 people not assigned and I had to click many buttons. So, so problems happen. We have to assign again. I'm really sorry, but 40 people did not assign and then I need oh, to make them assign. <laughs> okay. Um, so please. Alistair, yeah. Alistair, the, the time on this uh, inner sessions are going to be restart as well. We're going to have the, the same length of time. Um, yeah, we, we have a little bit of wiggle room. Yeah, yeah, we can, we can. 
stuff and, happens. And, and will the we were in a breakout room and it wasn't clear if it was being recorded uh, or not. It should be recording recorded, but but by you directly, Bill. So if you can, you should be. Ah, sorry. No, it's an important thing. Maybe I need to turn you into a, being a co-host so you can you can re record it. Well, that's an, a very important thing to tell. <laughs> yeah. No, in fact, so you know, uh, and the same for you, Ralph. Yeah. Great point, Bill, because I want to listen to the ball. Great. Yeah, can we enter the room again, please? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. Isn't it beautiful? So, Luca, how do I things? get? So, uh, how do you get us to the room again, Luca? Uh, unfortunately, we are opening the rooms again, and then you need to rejoin. Oh. So you select it. I'm opening oh, yeah. them. Okay, again. okay. Are you, are Thank you, you. Are you a starting this. a starting sign? Okay, now I get it. Look at uh... hello again. Okay, hello again. Sorry for this technical problem. I hope everybody finds his way back to us, and let's also yeah, let's wait for some time. As mentioned, um, we were about to move to the market failures and I will share again the screen. Sorry for this. All right. And again, you see the screen. Um, um, yeah, market failures um, are inefficiencies of markets. Um, assuming that individuals optimize themselves or their goals. And uh, typically market failures are addressed by governmental activities or regulation. And this can cause um, government failure on its own because it adds complexity and also self-interest from new stakeholders. So what we did here is we put in on some um, market failures we came up with. It's somehow subjective, it's somehow um, provocative, but and I see you also work on it, great. <laughs> and um, what the, the, the overall structure is the following. Um, we have the light laying bubbles, uh, bubbles, they are the market failures um, structured in different categories and the standing one, the right one is the government failure. What we ask you now is to put a red straw to the market failure that you believe is the most imminent. And we will discuss about how to solve this with the concepts we present in our conversation session. So this one will be selected at the end of this um, selection. And um, we will, um, and you can also um, mark the one, um, market failure that you don't believe is a market failure at all. And you can also add additional market failures that are not on the list with the sticky notes on the right. And um, yeah, for example, if you look at public goods, we have a, a tendency on, on, to, to look at data and tech, which is probably very near to platforms. Externalities, of course, are very near to regeneration and longevity ideas. And um, Enzo, would you like to talk a little bit about the stakeholder topic? You are on mute. Yes. So I think it's a very interesting what in the previous session uh, we heard about the how stakeholders conflicts actually in the current landscape organization create also centrality of the power. And then this actually creates a market failure where there is no stakeholder alignment towards uh, a shared value, a shared understanding towards uh, a purpose the organization want to reach. So I think this uh, is something that happens at all levels. It's also interesting to think how some stakeholder groups could generate a bigger and uh, I think deeper value in some organization. So it's important to address uh, where in which context stakeholder conflicts actually create impact. And let's, you're also working, already working on it. Let's spend some more time. I have the time of four minutes now, but I see a lot of people already placed it. It's, it's quite scattered. So I, I think it will be a challenge to define the one that is mm. most important from this audience, which is interesting. But um, yeah, let's see how it evolves. Some more time. Little new ones, but this is also interesting. And I mean, this could be something we could um, evolve over time also. 
Um, yeah, well, I was thinking to uh, to take one insight from the interesting conversation we heard about uh, narratives and stories and also language. So how even uh, markets failure uh, is down to the narrative uh, in, instead of create a good narrative, they focus on stories or short term, uh, which also connected there. It could be even a deeper layer about short term is of stories instead of narratives, for example. Still some movement and we have the timer. So I think middleman value extraction is a high voted one, very much refers to platforms, I think, which is interesting and ways of resources also quite high. And tax erasure is not a problem we see. And also the data stuff is the public yeah. good. Data as a public good seems to not be common sense here. All right, I think there's not much movement. So probably we move on to the next part, but I think um, it's pretty obvious middleman value extraction is the most voted one. And the second one is waste of resources. So keep these two for the conversation. And mm -hmm. I would say, let's stop the timer and move on to the next part because then we have a little bit more time for the conversation. And now we go to frame number five. Um, this is about some co concepts from the realm of token engineering and the overall goal is to um, improve market mechanisms and governance mechanisms Sorry, Andreas, to interrupt. I think it's a, a frame number three. I see people going number five. No, it's the frame number three that Andreas is talking to. Okay, no, just you mentioned five, so just not to confuse. It's, Go ahead. Um, one moment. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, um, um, what makes um, markets um, regenerative? We believe it's some kind of ethics, fairness, and agency and longevity of the systems. And the idea is really to implement these kind of attributes into market mechanisms and not creating additional complexity. And um, now I go to frame number six, token engineering which is a rough overview about the uh, discipline of token engineering. Um, on, the, on the top, you see a quote that from Mark, Michael Zakam, who is one of the creators of token engineering. The first people who created it have been Trent McConaughey and Mark Zagam, 2018. And um, if you look at it, it, it's really very, very near to longevity and resilience of systems. And also about really aligning different stakeholders on a common goal. And if you look at the left, the butterfly or the flower, there you see it's, it's seen as to be, a, let's say multidisciplinary approach, very strongly in system, system theory, but also in engineering-like thinking and also uh, the economies of course and psychology and legal stuff. So it's a multidisciplinary approach to uh, yeah, create systems based on token principles. And if we talk about engineering, we not mean mechanical engineering, but systemic engineering. And that includes the possibility to emergence, nonlinearity and feedback loops. And um, it's also yeah, one trait is to create predictability across a common goal. So one aspect to do that is create incentives to, yeah, encourage right behavior according to the common goal. And this is not only monetary. We talk about value flows, but these values are not only financial. And what we also see, if you look at the bottom, the process, it's not we create a system and that's it. It's really a full life cycle view on the whole yeah, system creation and um, life, lively, lifetime. Now I move over to the token design frame. And here you see three bubbles, token design, monetary policy, DAOs. I want to start with token design. If you look at uh, the token design space defines traits of tokens. And if you look at a typical company share or company organization, you would have governance and value or ownership being bundled as one trait of a share of a company. 
And this is something you can unbundle with token design and token engineering. I want to highlight or want to drive you to the area of price discovery because um, first thing we believe is if something, um, um, if you create a market for something, you can um, value it and create value flows and thereby increase allocate, allocation and distribution effectiveness. So one idea is really to create markets where at the moment there are no ones. For example, by tokenization of real world assets, by, for example, fraction, tokenizing real estate and fractionalizing it, making real estate accessible to more people, or by creating uh, markets of where it's little liquidity, for example, with um, automated market makers, AMMs, you can create markets without much liquidity in the typical sense. Another thing is really to create new assets that um, um, are um, 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 tradable, for example, assets like data. And one interesting aspect is also the bonding curve approach where you can create and put different trades into the pricing mechanism of how to price the asset. And then I want to direct you on the bottom left, token distribution. I think um, financial and markets are not bad, but of course it's not very good if it's, if it's centralized. So the question is who gets the tokens under which circumstances? One idea is really to distribute tokens to many stakeholders, not only owners, but for example, users or creators or any other stakeholder that adds value to the system. One of the key ideas is really to uh, create or to, to allow people to uh, get tokens based on their contribution to the system at all, overall. For example, users that are um, participating in a platform are typically adding a lot of value. If you look at Facebook or something like this, it's not only the ones who built the platform, and so this is a very important thing um, and a lot of flexibility that you have here. And now, just briefly on the top right, the topic of DAOs. If you have this token design, we talk in the token space about yeah, smart contracts, which would be the design of the token and the enforcement of the, of the contract and the rules, which is an advantage compared to differentiation between design and enforcement. So smart contracts are not really smart, they are self-enforcing and um, thereby they could act as the implementation for the transaction engine as mentioned or as defined by P Platform Design Toolkit, for example. And DAOs would be the organization, the human side of the, um, of the token design, which would be the learning engine. And on the top right, you see different DAOs that are already there, grants DAOs that, that, um, that um, finance, special courses, art DAOs, AI data DAOs, but it's also possible to think of a public goods DAO, for example, a DAO for a forest, or probably DAOs are the best way to govern platform itself, meaning are platforms uh, yeah, a public good? So yeah, different ideas, ideas and inspirations, hopefully from my side. Now I hand over to Renzo to cover the topic of polycentric governance. Dick Andreas, um, if you just could you please just move on the uh, yeah on we the slide on here? Right. Yeah, perfect. So, so here the, I want just point out to start from just the title. Governance is a journey, not a destination. And if you look at governance, you think of like four generic steps. You have a proposal, discussion, voting, and execution. So currently, the governance structure we are all involved. Uh, happened through a legal system with a succession of third parties involved, involved that enforce a certain rule or agreement. So this will prove the given decisions as a valid. So at the moment we experience all of this, especially in um, during COVID, society is in high demand of turning this uh, top down and control fashion into a collective ongoing engagement in the decision making process. So now, if you look at this slide in the middle, I put a decision space versus voting space. So we start from the decision space and you look in the top, sitting with the problem before offering solution. So, but we step back. So why we should change our older ways? 
So the hierarchical structure, the wire of our society is not necessarily bad, but must be updated to create this path of plurality of voices that really match our sense of emergency. So we live in a very interconnected society. The voting system based on held elections every few years doesn't belong with the challenge that we face. So then we have lack of trust for a government, uh, lack of transparency of resource allocation, lack of reputation. And these are really scars on our skin. They need to become a new skin. So therefore you start from the digital space, you really understand what's the problem and uh, you start exploring first this space, connect to the stakeholders to really understand how to include stakeholders for a sort of longevity of dialogue. So first step, deciding how to decide. You see here in this space I wrote, so this decide how to decide is to understand what framework could establish a common ground to being able to explore these frameworks. So then the second step is what needs government? What tools exist? So I think Andreas mentioned something about the blockchain space. You heard about proof of work, proof of stake, but it's not just that. There is community constitutions, policies, code of conduct, collective fund allocation, rewards for contribution of work. So this means then we move to the idea of embracing polycentricity, which means creating space for different kinds of decision making process that enable uh, a different tool for different stakeholder groups. So here we are not talking about that governance solve everything, but we need to understand different chosen tools that would meet local requirements. So now if you move from top down towards voting space, again, there are something that Andreas mentioned before, the smart contract it's a layer, it's just a software that could be maybe need upgraded. So need decisions there. So the funding layer, you want, you want to vote to distribute resources, cultural layer, for example, cultural decisions about code of conduct preferences. So this means that we move towards understanding that we all know some uh, a high level, democratic, meritocratic, uh, but has some shortcomings. So democratic is one-to-one, -one, it's time-boxed space, meritocratic example, even this workshop, let's say we decide something, but Andreas made most of it and just came with all the power. And this is a kind of counterbalance, the whole idea of creating collective engagement. And now if you go down, the idea of quadratic conviction voting is something to look at, where basically there is the quadratic voting is uh, something that happened in Colorado 2019. Actually, today we saw somebody from Radical X Exchange with Demo Democracy Hurts Foundation. They actually apply this to uh, generate some decisions of builds. So quadratic voting, just to give you a brief overview, your first vote is one, the second is squared, which means is uh, four, twice. So the third is three times. That means that your choice will cost you more that give you the idea of that ensure that only those who care about that issue will cast additional votes. Finally, conviction voting. So conviction voting high level is a real time streaming tool. It's a novel approach uh, linked to even common stack. We'll talk about this later and create a continuously organizing approach towards preferences into discrete decisions into the management of the community's resources. So it's less like voting and more like signal processing tool. So having said that, I just want to kind of debunk the, the myth of governance tool that, that is one that solves everything. We need to have this differentiation. Before, you know, we were talking about, in, we heard, we need to have this diversity of approaches. And therefore, I just want to conclude, say, always define first the digital space before exploring the voting space. So with this said, I think I will end to uh, Paula for the next step. I think you are mute. All right. So I will just be talking to you and then I'll share my screen to, to show a couple of things. Um, so I wanna share a little bit about, um, I don't know why, am I like on the, 
center of like on the viewer thing. Oh, okay. It, does, it doesn't look like that here, but that's fine. So um, I want to talk to you about how we can create uh, blockchain protocols that can enable regenerative applications. It's a bit tricky. Uh, I am a co-founder of Democracy Earth. We are a nonprofit uh, that has been researching this, you know, potentially like how we could create global democracies uh, using blockchain protocols. But it's pretty difficult because there are some limitations with this system. And I'll talk about those limitations and how we can overcome them with different types of protocols. So um, some of you are in the blockchain space and might have heard of proof of work and proof of stake might be super familiar with that. But uh, since some of you might not, I'll just give a quick explanation of what these systems are. Um, and they are the they are the they're called the consensus mechanisms behind uh, proof of work is behind Bitcoin and proof of stake is more is usually more associated with Ethereum, and they are the mechanisms which make the blockchain tick. And essentially, what they're doing is they are facilitating consensus, but the primary function is that they are determining who can join the blockchain and who cannot join. So in proof of work, uh, it is saying that whoever has computing power, mining power can join the Bitcoin blockchain. Proof of stake is saying that if you have financial stake in a network, then you can join that network. And the reason why these systems are creating these uh, types of barriers or conditions of entry is because identity and membership are super difficult in, in decentralized networks. Because in a centralized network, you usually have a central, a central entity who is saying uh, who can join and who can't or who is verifying your documents. But in a decentralized system, there's nobody who can fulfill that role. So all you can do is kind of create limitations and try to avoid people creating multiple fake identities, right? This is called the SIBO attack. And it's a type of attack where one entity creates multiple, multiple identities and then takes over uh, a decentralized permissionless network. So you don't want that. This is why proof of work and proof of stake are creating these mechanisms. The problem with them is that they're based on scarce resources. And the consequence of that is that they are plutocratic whoever has more of those resources, computing power or financial stake is just going to have a bigger, uh, more, more power within those networks. So the governance of those networks, of those blockchains is plutocratic. And this is not a very good base and not, not a very good foundation for regenerative applications. So how can we have a different system which, uh, which can give us a better foundation? This is uh, what, what is called proof of personhood. Um, it's a new type of protocol which has been emerging in the past few years since uh, late 2018. There are a few examples which I'm going to run through uh, in, in a moment. And what they're doing is, I, like I said, identity is a huge issue. So they don't want people to be able to create multiple identities in, the, in a decentralized network. So they're trying to understand how uh, can people verify or, or prove that they only have one identity within a network. So they don't want the, the threat is bots. Uh, we don't want bots to take over a network. And we also don't want people to be making, to creating multiple IDs. And once you have that, you have a list with unique humans and there are amazing use cases that you can pilot. The first is a democracy. Uh, like I said, most protocols are plutocratic. Most blockchain based protocols are plutocratic. But if you have a list of unique humans, you can do a one person, one vote system instead of a $1 one vote system or a one CPU, one vote system. So uh, you can have an actual democracy, which is great. And then, um, 
And then you can also create a universal basic income based on cryptocurrency. So you can create uh, a token and you can distribute it uh, in an egalitarian way. Um, so these are a few use cases. And now I will show you one example of a proof of personhood protocol. And then I will show that one more in depth and then I'll talk uh, briefly about a few others. Um, so let me share my screen, one second. All right, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. I have so this piece, is proof of uh, humanity. Up a bit. We're running a little bit off time, but yeah. This is proof of humanity. And uh, in order to register here, we don't want people to be able to create multiple IDs. So what you have to do is you connect with your wallet and then you make a video of yourself. This is mine. This is, is what we call a Turing resistant proof. It's a type of proof that is very difficult to generate with artificial intelligence. Uh, one day deep fakes may get there, but not yet. And then here, I, I didn't get a vouch because I was uh, one of the seed identities, but people are vouching for each other. You can see the vouchers that I've made. Uh, so you create this additional layer of security. And then there's a third layer of security. Here you can see that there's this request removal button. So if someone thinks that I am a, uh, a, a deep fake or if there's something wrong with my identity, you see here that this is my UBI. It's the universal basic income that I'm getting. And this is a bounty which is available for others if they can prove that I'm a fake identity. They can request my removal and then this will go to a decentralized court um, which is also blockchain based and jurors, human jurors will evaluate. So ultimately this system is a system of humans who are verifying other humans. Um, this is one example. I'll talk in more detail about a few others, uh, but yeah, just to highlight the use cases, this is uh, the UBI. And you can see here in my uh, wallet that this is, you know, a real token. It's right now. Okay. For some reason it's not working, but, um, my MetaMask, but it's uh, worth around $1,000 um, a year. You can see here that I have 230. And, and then we have a democratic down, uh, which is one person, one vote. And we have 6,000 people registered in this, in this system. And uh, yeah, we can manage a treasury of this, um, of this uh, system, of this, of this DAO. So, it's a new uh, type of application. I'll give a few more examples, but I hope that you can, this can help you think about how different types of protocols can have different implications for in their ability to generate more democratic and, and regenerative economies. Thanks a lot, Paula. Great. Thanks, Renzo, also. And we are heading over to the mural again. I'm sharing it. And please go to uh, the frame number 10, the examples. I want to direct you to the middle. I mean, you see bubbles and you see um, different, let's say, characteristics and one um, project can have different ones. So there is an overlap. And for example, if you look at the middle one, Ocean Protocol, Ocean Protocol is a protocol that is focusing on data. So at the end, they have created a data market based on the assumption or the insight that data is an underutilized asset and that there is nearly no data collaboration. So at the end, if there is data pooling, which we don't want, but um, how can you collaborate on data, for example, while preserving privacy and really allowing for the right use of the data and also combining many uh, sources of data, for example, for AI or something like this. They have created data tokens, which represent these data assets, and you can uh, have a share in this data asset. And, participate in the value created by the data asset. And what they also did was uh, the Web3 sustainability loop. There is a link there where you can see how can you create a token based um, token model that lasts forever at the end. So really, um, yeah, 
feedback loops in there and really safe, sustainable approach that was unique when they came up with it and was um, copied by some other projects already. And there's an ocean DAO. So the goal is to decentralize the power about the protocol over time. And the ocean DAO is, for example, giving grants for projects that are yeah, advancing the field and advancing the whole um, system. Very briefly, I want to direct you to Gitcoin. Glenn also mentioned them. They are a, a platform to finance public goods, especially open source. And they have run 10 quadratic funding rounds, which is one of the aspects, one of the um, concepts from Radical Exchange. So a lot of experimentation insights into how these kind of things work. And they also have a reputation token, meaning if you contribute to the community, you get tokens and you can govern the system based on these tokens. So at the end, participants in the project are really deciding where it goes. And there's also a link to it. And um, probably very briefly, Uniswap, it's a DeFi exchange. But what they did was they gave every user of the system 400 um, Uni tokens, which are worth now much more than when they came out. So a substantial wealth was created. And also there is a, a multi-billion dollar um, um, pool of money is managed by the uni token holders to advance the whole ecosystem. So at the end, you see some ideas of how these, let's say, ideas can play out. Renzo, would you like to highlight some projects also? Yes, so I think I would like to uh, make you think about the uh, crypto art. I think you might all have heard this NFTs craze. And uh, just to give you even more context, who doesn't necessarily is familiar with its concept, so non-fungible tokens represent the financialization of digital goods. So this NFTs design and, and yeah, there are marketplace, they are basically booming and they have become let's say an undeniable growing sector of digital finance as andreas mentioned but not just there in arts and music as well so i think if you think of art galleries around the globe if you look at the covid they've been basically been suffering and more cultural experiences are, are happened online so the in ethereum found like a growing niche for creators to share this digital art interact directly with a community of collectors so there is a potential uh, very big potential of social communities around crypto arts but uh, just again a step back the traditional art markets are notoriously in liquid with famous work of art so changing hands only a few times over the course of a generation but with digital art on Ethereum, this digital art trading is as simple as sending a transaction in MetaMask. I think as uh, even it can happen 24 seven. Um, so now uh, I think even another example, uh, maybe I will be more close uh, is about music as everyone is close to kind of music is uh, think of the revenue from streaming platforms like Spotify, Apple Music. So for artists, is a very little. So Spotify paid artists something like 0 0.33, 0 0.33, 0. Point, sorry, 0 0. 0.33, uh, and 0 0.054 per stream. So many musicians, uh, there is, they are looking at to release their music. One of those is Kings of Leon, like a mainstream band, but they were selling their own um, NFTs. Uh, to give more uh, authenticity and ownership. So this is just to give you like a few examples of crypto art and impact. So Great. I guess, yeah. And if if you come back to this mirror later, you can probably look at other uh, projects also. There are some links, so um, yeah, probably interesting. Let's move over to the conversation part. We are now on slide number or in frame number 11. I've put the two uh, most mentioned uh, market failures into it already. And please read the three questions and yeah, write down what you what comes up from your side in regards to these questions. I put in the timer and after that, let's discuss based on the answers in the in the in the sticky list. 
just a clarification even on these questions uh, you know feel free to uh you don't have to reply to all the three the one they it's closer to your fields of work of curiosity or um just feel free to uh, uh start from there and then of course if you have time uh go for the others I see somebody already have has been writing down some stuff. Great. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, while you put this, since Andreas was not able to, since we're running out of time and I wasn't able to walk you through the examples, in case any of you is interested in just learning more about proof of personhood, you can go to that circle and you will see on the top, there's the seminal paper. Uh, which I have co-authored and it's basically giving a, a great introduction to anyone, you know, if you don't know anything about blockchains, if you don't know anything uh, about that space in particular, this is uh, a great paper to just uh, learn step by step about everything in this field. And then around that circle, there are a few of the existing protocols uh, today, which are, which are providing proof of personhood. Uh, on the blockchain as well and creating their own decentralized identities and their own uh, basic income schemes. I think we have even more time. I think there was a message uh, from Alistair that we can expand the session even 10 minutes more. So I think, Paula, if you feel like to give more context to, to example uh, or connect with the questions, I think feel free to... Uh, uh, jump in. Sure, maybe after we after uh, everyone finishes these uh, with the stickers, or I don't know, what do you think, Andreas? Um, you mean yeah, now the sticky notes? Yeah, I would say let's let's stay here and um, probably come back later or um, spend more time here. And I see the timer is running, only two minutes and more. So I think. As said, you have you can come back to the mirror board and can follow up. And of course, we are also interested to get in contact with you or stay in contact with you and really extend the conversation. A lot of questions, which I find great, because that's probably a good framing for continuing the conversation. Probably I have to zoom in a little bit. Yeah, I think I also took some questions from the chat uh, that I will put in the question and then, uh, I mean, we can split these questions. Andreas, I think you, you can start the first one and the second, maybe uh, also Paula, if you want to take any other uh, then we can connect who writes and then ask. I think a few people are still writing, but if not, yeah, Thomas is writing something. And after that, there is a break. So we have a little bit of time as already mentioned, so you will not miss something. All right. Middleman value extraction. All right, 20 seconds, but I also see there's not much writing going on at the moment. So I would say, let's look at some of the stickies and we will um, point to one sticky and the person who has written down the answer or the, the content probably can explain it then. All right, four seconds. 
first of all, thanks a lot for um, yeah, coming up with so many topics and so many answers. We will all, of course, have a look at everything afterwards, but now let's pick some that are probably very interesting. For example, if I look uh, to the first question, middleman value extraction, I see this sticky with DAO in form of prediction markets can enable prevention mechanisms. Who has uh, come up with this? Probably if you want, unmute yourself and say something about it. How, what you mean by Thank that? Thank you. Yeah, uh, so the, the main concept behind it is the wisdom of the crowd and the prediction markets. This uh, concept uh, was built uh, many years ago and uh, it was a great, uh, let's say great experiment in order to use the power of the market to uh, define the truth and to the understand the outcomes. Uh, for example, uh, there was an um, incident with the NASA spacecraft that uh, resulted in a market crash of all the suppliers for NASA. And then in a several, uh, let's say days, uh, all the companies uh, get their prices back just one stage on the bottom and that companies was that company actually was responsible for one small part that uh, resulted the crash of the aircraft so if we build DAO uh, let's say to engage more stakeholders more people and then we build it in a, in form of prediction market to check the outcomes of uh, specific uh, markets and we can see how people who are really in this market can uh, predict the market behavior and so give us some notion and give us some mechanism in order to prevent these market failures okay Thanks a lot. That's an advanced approach, but thanks for explaining also the prediction market as, uh, aspect. Um, I would like to, uh, sorry, Andreas, just like to jump into this uh, comment. Thanks for sharing. I think I'm sharing the chat uh, Gnosis protocol for the prediction market. I think this would be interesting for you to look into this because they are actually addressing what you just mentioned. Uh, yeah, I just want to give this. So back to you, Andreas. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, and I mean, um, it's advanced, probably we do not need the full complexity to get into that way. Middleman extraction, I mean, it's the typical challenge is here that the middleman takes 90% of the value created and creators and users who contribute probably much more, for example, in a platform, the consumers are largely part of the value creation because they provide the data and at the end, it's a data-based model. So, um, yeah, probably- Andreas, sorry to briefly interrupt you. We decided yeah. to make the breakouts up until the full hour. So you still have 22 minutes. Okay, thank you. That is great. Yeah, cool. All right, um, probably um, here, the, the one here, enable every stakeholder to participate in the value creation. Who wrote this? Who do you want to share what? Uh, yes, thank you. I wrote this, and uh, as you said, I was referring to um, that uh, the general user with tokeniza tokenization is um, able to um, profit by the value creation process, like, for example, with Uniswap, um, as they gave every user some tokens so that they can profit um, from the value they brought to Uniswap. Or another interesting example, in my opinion, are social media platforms uh, where the typical user don't profit from the time and effort they uh, bring into the social media platform, um, which can be addressed with tokenization too. Yes. Okay, yeah, great, thank you. Can I Jonas? jump into that, Andreas? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I think one thing which is important to highlight with regards to Uniswap, that was, uh, you know, what they did is quite common uh, in the blockchain ecosystem. It's a distribution mechanism, which is called an airdrop. They just distributed these tokens. But uh, again, the question of uh, unique uniqueness or personhood uh, comes up. The way that they did, they were able to do that because it was a secret. Nobody knew that they, was, they were going to do it in advance. So people didn't try to defraud the system by uh, utilizing their, uh, 
protocol with multiple wallets. Some people had used it with multiple wallets uh, and got their allocation, you know, multiple times. But uh, but I, and once again, probably the ones who had more money, so it wasn't super egalitarian. Um, but actually, for you to be able to do that type of distribution, once again, you would need some form, uh, some way of knowing, of of uh, being able to know who are the people in your system so that people are not just getting this token. So this question of uh, distributing uh, value in, in an egalitarian way or a fair way is crucial to, to personhood protocols. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I think we need both. We need the identity or the personhood and um, probably the level of participation or value creation of this entity and I think uh, what I see in the blockchain space at the moment, it's, it's a very fast moving, moving area with real skin in the game. And therefore I, th I see a lot of, let's say insights coming out of these experiments. For example, also 10 quadratic funding rounds with Gitcoin and so on. And so um, it's very exciting, but also yeah, still evolving. <laughs> and, and the ideas are there and we just have to implement them, I would say. <laughs> so the technology is far more proceeded than the social systems. And probably let's jump on the next question, I would say. I mean, yeah, Let, let's jump to the next question. Um, and the question is, how can the presented concepts advance regenerative platforms in general? And, I would like uh, to... Uh... So I'm interested to whoever wrote the DAO as hyperlocal entities. Uh, it's interesting, but it would be, I think, more engaging if anybody who share it to elaborate more. Yeah, that was me. Uh, hi. <laughs> this is exactly what I'm what I'm just right now creating here in the Black Forest. Um, so basically, I I see that there is a big discussion about blockchain and making big networks secure. And I think if we focus on like real local entities, like I'm really setting up uh, this in a village in the black forest around a space <clears throat> where you can really like, you know, the people, you know, the resources which are there. Um, so you don't have all these, these security issues and you can um, literally link it to the, to the added value you put onto that place, like you educate people, you create connections between people. So getting more um, onto the physical level, and that's why I connected this with, with, with the warm data and the value and the, and the ethical AI, because if you have authentic data, um, you create much more of a value together. And, um, and you need authentic data to create ethical AI. So therefore, I think if you like, you get it a lot closer to people and, and uh, you know your sources, you know how much land you have, you know how much forest you have. So you know exactly what kinds of values you are able to add. Um, you can link it much better and, and then just mm -hmm. create cross-sectional linked um, entities. Um, so. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Actually, if you have any link, please post in the chat. Maybe we can... Uh... Follow up post about it this. on the on the Miro under the examples page, and though yeah. everybody can have a look. I just I just upload a PDF for the for the for the DAO architecture, which is which is mm -hmm. uh, the, the the basement for that. Yeah, I just do that. Sounds now. really interesting. Very cool. Yeah, and I like the by ensuring can't by, uh, by ensuring tokens can't be accumulated over time. That's a pro <laughs> I think a provocation, but who did it? <laughs> Do you want to that, share that about me. it? Yeah, I'll try to get my video on. The camera's not working so yeah, well. Hi. Can you see me? Yeah, I think it's just kind of coming down to try to figure out where the innovation comes from a bit of a social perspective, right? So right now, our, some of the biggest problems in society are, of course, because we can accumulate currency uh, over time, and some people can a lot more, and, over, and that becomes a source of power and influence. So I think if you're looking for kind of that revolutionary piece, um, the idea of flowing value is what you want, right? The ability to kind of have that liquid, I think it was mentioned somewhere, that liquidity, that liquidity of, of value, of transactions, of, you know, whatever fosters good regenerative practice. And that can easily be stopped by individuals having the ability to accumulate 
and concentrate again tokens, values, however you want to choose to define currency over time. So if you're able to negate that, then I think you, you can get into some real breakthrough territory. Are you referring to this in terms of value sharing? So participating in the value created by the system or also in the governance, for example, I think it's a bit of, of governance? Yeah, maybe a bit of both. I mean, it, yeah. it's, it's, it's a hard space to sort of say, but you know, value you can be defined in so many ways. We tend to do it, it right now in the current paradigm quantitatively, mm -hmm. but I'm going to say I, I can totally understand that there's an, you know, the idea is to push into more qualitative uh, flows of value in this space, right, in, in the regenerative space. Um, so it's just that that danger again of relying on assumptions, right, that where if, if people don't, when people are presented with the opportunity to accumulate, we, we can often do that. And when we're presented with opportunities not to for, for uh, different reasons, um, we, we might not. But the current paradigm, we really are set around accumulation. So that's why I'm saying yeah, it's absolutely. there's an ability and to, yeah. If you look at the governance problem, um, the quadratic voting and conviction voting approaches, I think solve it somehow, not probably completely, but at least the big uh, token owners, their votes are um, devalued compared to small voters uh, by the quadratic devaluation of um, of, of big uh, high votes uh, or uh, the conviction voting shows at least oh there is a majority that I'm not sharing with so it mobilizes other people who think oh um, I I mean participate participation in, in governance is a challenge because probably small um, voters or small token holders are not very much encouraged to vote at all because they think I don't make the difference. And these mechanisms help to somehow um, address it. But uh, of course, we have to make sure it's not centralized again at the end. Yeah. You, you could look at, I'll just finish by saying you could look into the, the demurrage currency models of the 1930s. Maybe there's a way of, of building that model into the token itself so that you're all automatically discouraging from the get-go the ability to Im have imbalances between large and small token holders. But what I like is the possibility to unbundle different, let's say, use uh, utilities of tokens. It's uh, so you could even unbundle it. But thanks for this uh, post. Uh, quite interesting and good conversation. What post should we take next? Maybe, Andreas, given that we have basically 10 minutes uh, left, we can move to the what are the other important questions for us to address, given that I can see quite a few. And then we can just move to the, uh, the last point. What do you think? Yeah. Do you have a preference? A lot of text sometimes? Uh, yes, actually. Uh, I would like to ask uh, anyone who wrote, how can you make sure this framework applies to cultures who may have different beliefs in what is meaningful and valuable? Example, what makes uh, their lives worth living? Uh, would you mind to uh, just jump in and have a conversation about this? So, so that was me again, but maybe you want to give someone else a chance. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> okay, it okay, sounds good. Thank you for... Uh, for the willingness to uh, give the floor to someone else. Um... I like this one. It's a provocation again, but I think it will be interesting to hear the person who wrote it, <laughs> if he wants to or she wants to talk. Uh, which one, Andreas? Oh. Sorry. Uh, I'm here on, uh, oh, sorry, uh, I'm on the how would you explain this to a close family member, for example, your grandparents danger of the concept being inaccessible. Mm -hmm. I think you're finding out that I'm the provo provocateur. Uh, oh, it's me again. I like, I like provocateurs. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so to <laughs> me, it it is, a lot of our work is, of course, to try, from our foundation work is to explain the very technical into very accessible, right? So if we're, yeah. if we're, we're, we practice sometimes in our own family members, like how would you actually explain this um, at a dinner table with your own family? So mm -hmm. I think it's, it's less about provocation and more about you were mentioning in that question, right? Uh, what's the question there? It's covered. I mean, um, um, yeah, I like the point and it was also highlighted by John Hegel, for example, and others yeah. presenting earlier. I mean, uh, we need to make sure we, um, do not create more complexity that nobody understands. On the one hand, if we empower people, um, they it's 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 
they have to decide. And in many cases, they are not allowed, allowed to decide at the moment. So, I mean, it's a change of mindset. It probably has to start in school to really say, hey, now you can decide. I mean, if you are an employee of a company, what can you decide? If you are a voter in a, in a, in a country, what can you decide? Now you can decide, of course, yeah, you are an executive now to, to, to um, and it's a duty. Uh, you have to attribute time, you have to learn and so on. And therefore I, I like this thing and I sometimes refer to it as decision literacy. I'm very much in the data space where we talk about data literacy. Everybody needs to understand data, which is also a challenge, but um, it's, um, we have to learn a lot and everybody, Thomas wants to add something. I mean, scalable yeah, for listen. learning, not scalable for efficiency anymore. Thomas. <laughs> I, I love I love the way uh, Yannick is just, is just moving this into that direction. Um, this is the reason why I came up with the village. Um, a village uh, used to be for, for hundreds and thousands of years uh, the, the, the center point of the community. And like, um, uh, like the Africans are saying, you need a village to grow up a child. And uh, within a village, you can, you can easily see who's contrib contributing what. And I think this is one major problem. If you, if you extend the blockchain too far, it's like you're losing, you're losing touch to like anything. So it's again and again, it's just morphing up into the meta field and no one can really explain what's happening. But at the end of the day, our economy is something quite profound. But the problem is we don't show all the aspects that it has. Like we don't show what is taken away from nature. We are not showing what it is taking away out of the families. So uh, making these things visible and showing what actually literally you could add as value if you re-support these kind of structures, you can easily explain it to your grandparents to say, we need a kind of a, an economy that gives back to the planet, that gives back to the people, that works to connect the people because it's a much healthier way. And if you can measure these effects, you can prove, literally prove that this new kinds of economy are much more um, productive and effective mm -hmm. and growth oriented um, than, than they seem to be because everyone right now thinks that sustainability is like something nice and maybe we can do it and all these things. No, it's just much more intelligent to do it like that. And I think your grandparents could tell you why it is much more intelligent to, 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 to stay on that, on that focus yeah. level. So just, just to I throw mean, in that. I hope usability and understandability will increase over time. I mean, with innovations, you start with additional complexity. For example, if you take the first computers, it was normal to read a book, a, a, a manual about a program. Nobody cared about usability. Now every you can start intuitively. Everybody can um, work with, um, with uh, uh, smartphones or something like this. But first you need to, let's say, build complexity and then you can make it simple but we need to make it yeah quite fast because over the time technology is evolving too fast so we need to think of how can we make it available for yeah many people or as much people as possible and 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 i think just to add that it, it can it can shift like the, the technology is able to 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 like do all these complex things in the background so you are able as a society as a village to do the very profound things easily so i think technology is right now too much of a topic um, yeah. it should be in the back so we are able to <laughs> physically do things otherwise yeah. great thanks a lot i look at the clock we have some more information anybody want to add something to this conversation before we move to the closing no, then I would say I hand over to Renzo. Here, this is the ecosystem where we sourced these ideas. Yes, so I think we heard today Radical Exchange, uh, Token Engineering, Andreas mentioned uh, the comments as well. Democracy Art, I think also I can invite uh, Paula to mention more about uh, this, but for myself, I would like even to emphasize that these examples are place where we can nurture learning and join communities to really understand uh, what they're trying to solve collectively. And you can imagine that each of these, uh, for example, common start, I, I think constantly in the last couple of years uh, collaborating, they have access to information from Discord. Uh, I think you can join communities on Telegram 
you can really like have a uh, room for your saying. So um, Komasak is a very good example that have this open source library from Agobendi bonding curve uh, to the conviction body that I mentioned before that they are trying to experiment in different areas, the impact of um, more egalitarian approach. This doesn't necessarily mean like with the political, it's just more allocation of resources, public goods. That's what I would like to emphasize. Um, uh, Paolo, would you like to add anything else about Proof of Humanity uh, to join them? Um, sure, I mean, if you, uh, let me turn on my camera. Um, if you're interested in learning more, feel free to reach out. Uh, Proof of Humanity, Democracy Serve has been, uh, has, is behind Proof of Humanity, it's co-developing it with Claris, but it's now a DAO, a decentralized organization. It's the first democracy on Ethereum uh, so it's pretty exciting. It's been live for the past two months. And uh, yeah, if you're interested in learning more about the different methodologies to prove uh, uniqueness in the blockchain, also feel free to reach out. There are examples in, in that uh, circle that I wasn't able to talk through um, with different methodologies that are super interesting. And these are great topics because for everything that we're discussing here, uh, quadratic funding, quadratic voting, all of these hinge upon this kind of need to have a unique, uh, a unique personhood online on the digital realm. So it's, it's a super important topic and I welcome everyone to engage with it. Thanks a lot. And I moved over if you follow the Zoom to us. Yeah, you see our names, you see our contact addresses, feel free to reach out to anybody of us. And of course, yeah, as I said, this is the starting of a journey. I think we heard a lot of interesting concepts, idea during the whole day. And we hope these ideas we just talked about can be one part of the solution or of yeah, regenerative platforms at the end. And um, we have a short um, survey. It's a one question survey. This is a link. And yeah, you can leave your email also. And we would be happy to give us this one question answer to give an idea how to yeah, focus over the yeah, course of any follow up activities. So please, yeah. After the questionnaire, probably save the link and do it later or yet now in the in the break. Thanks to all for share, for joining us for the active con uh, conversation and looking forward to the rest of the conference and to hearing more from you and continuing the conversation. Thank you, everyone, and it was very good uh, interaction and looking forward to expand on on these uh, uh, conversations. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Now, and thank you so much, Andreas, for inviting us. Thanks to everybody. Thanks to Renzo and Paula also. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you, Paula. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for the preparation. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Thomas. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, and everybody. Let's go to the main station on the break. Bye. Yeah, bye. I stop sharing now. think I need to move. Ah, the room is closing now. See you in the main stage. And pause bio break. So for everybody coming back into the plenary, we now move into a shortened 15 minutes. Pause, grab an apple, coffee, tea, whatever time zone you're in, you know, or something maybe to calm your nerves. Uh, and we meet quarter past. So in 15 minutes from now. And Luca can just, uh, you know, 
share some music. And then we will move into the fish bowls, gathering uh, everything that we have been working on in the parallel sessions. So see you back in 15 minutes. I will stay here in case there are questions. Or just to dance, you know? Yeah, fine. And just move it.